Hello. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, <laughs> wherever you are. It's um, always really um, special to tune in right away to everyone. And um, you might, I really want to encourage you to take the time to see everybody before we start with our eyes closed and to to maybe feel the support and the mudita, the, the appreciation of each other sitting together. It's really important. It's so fun to see where it's um, dark out, <laughs> where, where it's morning, and it's amazing. I guess it's, here we go. Great. Good to see you all. Yeah, really nice. Hello. Hmm. Hmm. Let me know when you're ready. To yeah, see I think we can go. Ready. The recording's going. Though. Okay, great. Oh, just Harry's home from the hospital. <laughs> oh. Great. We'll take the. Uh, Take your time to just kind of um, let your attention settle into your sitting posture and really become aware that you can be mindful, just mindful of sitting, knowing you're sitting. And you can become aware of your six sense doors, sense doors, the uh, knowing, knowing you're seeing, receiving the sensations of vibration, texture, light, dark shadow at your eyes. I often find it helpful to notice if there's any tightness or light tension behind my eyes. Not, not trying to change it, but just notice it if there's any. And it, it kind of helps me like relax deeper inside. Knowing you're smelling and tasting. Receiving any textures and vibrations there. Just noticing the changing sensations. Knowing you're hearing. Knowing you're sitting with all the myriad physical sensations coming and going, that music of aliveness, of textures, vibrations, 
like the weather, warm and cool, cold or hot. The range of hard to soft, rough and smooth, flowing, streaming, rigid or stuck. Movement, tightness, light vibration, pressure, tingling. And thinking, just knowing that thinking is happening. And it's important to remember that what we're doing is waking up to what's happening at our six sense doors moment by moment. And in this practice, we're not trying to get anything or get rid of anything. We can begin to notice the quality of the awareness we bring to our moment-to-moment -moment experience. And how that affects our experience. And we can hear again and again that it's, it's not the experience that matters, but our relationship with what's happening. If there's tiredness or worry or anxiety, restlessness or doubt, or over exuberance or joy, a quiet abiding peace or aversion to any pain or attachment to any pleasure. And so we check to see, are we interested in just what's happening? not what we think should be happening. Can we be sometimes interested in life just as it is? Noticing any kind of rhythm we might have between getting caught in the past and future. That rhythm of a kind of stress of being caught in time. And then the rhythm of coming back to being with just with what is. Swinging back and forth. To the movement of the breath. Receiving. We can only receive the changing sensations of the rising movement in breath, just as it's happening, not a past memory, 
or a future idea. And then with the falling movement, just as it's happening. In our hands, sensations, not the past ideas or memories, but just as the sensations appear and disappear. Experiencing sometimes that relief of shifting from it being a way of relating where it's my breath, my hands, my feet, my thoughts, my emotions my peace, my awareness. It shifts sometimes from identification of experiencing, experience referring back to a of a sense of possession to a non-possessiveness. Not based on memory, but alive. Receiving life just as it is. Receiving sound, texture. Noticing it disappear by itself. Thoughts disappearing by themselves. Breath disappearing by itself. with great, gentle, kind, quiet, abiding with life just as it is.
May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. Thank you for your practice. Thank you, Michelle. folks Hmm. Uh, a few years ago I started um, joining a a local outrigger canoe paddling team over here not team (laughs) eclectic mishmash (laughs) <laughs> people who wake up early to go paddle. Um, it's uh, for folks who don't know, the outrigger canoes are kind of traditional Polynesian style of uh, canoe, or they can kind of be a little more narrow um, because they have a, an outrigger, an ama, they call it. Um, so it has like a sort of ballast, it has two arms and a sort of you know thing that kind of helps you keep balance. So you can lean into it if it gets choppy or whatever. And these are six person canoes and um, it was really something awesome, you know, really for just kind of fun for me and felt like good exercise and, you know, uh, living in a place that's so dominated energetically and practically by water. Um, it was just, you know, I don't have a boat other, you know, it's like, I, so I don't get out into the water outside of this, you know, I'm swimming at the shore, but so it was, it was just been a powerful way to also get more, um, in relationship with the water and the ocean, all those elements and forces and, um, be a part of a community in a way that's been really great. Um, and there's something powerful about the process of uh being in a canoe with you know five other people and um i've spoken about this some of you may have heard me give some other talks about you know some of the learnings i feel like i've gathered from it but you know there is something um about the the kind of unity of action that is really expected and required in order for you to be able to move forward together in a way that's safe and the way that um, is efficient and, uh, you know, feels good. Um, so there really is a, not a lot of choice about how you're, you're paddling, you know, you're paddling, it's, you're sort of at the mercy of the, the stroker, the person up front who's counting, you know, the strokes and, and kind of pacing it all. And there's a huge range, as you can imagine, of those people who sit in that front seat, you know, some of them do it slower, some of them do it faster, and everyone, behind them is going to have their preferences so who they like and they like it a little more slow or they like it more intense and 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 it's just you know it's definitely a thing you notice there's like the you know people 80 year old folks who still are just like they still want to win (laughs) that hasn't that hasn't been worked out of their system you know uh there, 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 there's still this idea that winning is going to mean something. <laughs> and then you have me who like, I could just veg out and like stare at the water and not paddle at all, you know, and watch like as the sun rises, like the colors and the, you know, ripples and the, so you have these like, that's, that's maybe one description of the range <laughs> of those of us out there. But that when it comes down to it, your job is to just, you know, paddle in unison and, um, 
get rid of your preferences or, or sublimate them to the, the greater good, you know, and there's something very good about that, you know, there's something very wonderful about that, um, if challenging at times. But since COVID, um, that group hasn't been able to gather. They actually have been recently with masks and stuff like that. But there were a few months where, you know, all gatherings like that, you know, especially athletic things and um, were, were stopped. And so um, I had, I just happened to have bought a, a used one person canoe, uh, OC1 uh, from a friend in Waimea uh, around that time. So in these last few months, I have been going out more on my own um, in the mornings uh, and paddling at my own pace, my own rhythm. Um, and it has been quite powerful um, in, a, in a very different way, you know, of uh, realizing like the, that, that the rhythm of my actions, uh, of my paddling was really totally up to me. And um, just seeing how much there is to explore in that has been really deep um, and something that this past week in particular, I feel like I've come to a different place with it where um, I think there was a lot of, a lot in period where I feel like I was paddling to the rhythm that I felt like was for my physical heart right? The sense of like, okay, it's exercise and this is good for me and I'm going to, you know, kind of paddle strenuously and, um, and, and some of what would come with, you know, that I sort of got trained in with the group, you know, um, of the sort of intensity to it. And there is a goodness to that vigor and there's something about that that feels, um, uh, you know, develops a sense of capacity and strength and, and that, that has felt good um, that I could, that I feel like safe out, all, you know, alone out on the um, on the water, uh, strong enough to be able to do it. But it also, I've realized, like, it can feel very disconnected. You know, I'm not, I'm not really attuned to the ocean or to myself or to what's going on around me. There's a sort of very single pointed kind of driving force around that. And so recently, I've been kind of doing that a little bit more on the way out. And then when I come back, really sort of paddling to my spiritual heart, you know, and not counting, you know, my strokes and not um, really trying to get anywhere, giving myself a little more time to amble and, um, and just seeing how profoundly different that is, you know, that it's, it's, um, there's a sensitivity to my inner world, right, a sensitivity to what feels appropriate, a sensitivity also then to my outer world, right, of of actually noticing the different currents that are happening and the different uh, angles of the waves, the wind, the, you know, the, the forces on the land around me, um, the sun, you know, there's a, a deeper sensitivity in that, um, that has felt very, um, very meaningful, very powerful and, um, has gotten me really kind of intrigued by this question of the rhythm of our lives and the rhythm of our actions and where where is that coming from um, in all of our day to day lives in terms of our 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 work our play our responsibilities our cooking our cleaning um, our engagement with one another where are we taking responsibility for the rhythm of action that we're generating and the impact of that on ourselves and one another? Where is it important to be um, very more sensitive to our inner rhythms? Where is it more important to be sensitive to the external conditions around us? Where is it important to explore our real individual and personal calling in that moment to the rhythm of our actions? Where does it feel important to actually unify that and synchronize that with the people around us, with our families, our friends, our communities, um, our world?
in some ways, I think we don't usually frame it in terms of rhythm. You know, I know that uh, in this in this context, in Dhamma context, in terms of meditation, um, but of course, there is something uh, powerful about recognizing these these rhythms that are actually happening in our in our systems, right? That there is a heartbeat that is um, regular <laughs> or irregular. Uh, there is a breath that is regular or irregular. You know, um, someone who I know who's done a lot of body work training has talked about, you know, that there are these rhythms of our organs moving around actually all the time, you know, that it's happening at these sort of like um, this, this degree that is outside of our conscious action. Um, that the sort of these, these we, the, our inner world physically or physiologically, our inner world is not all in balance, right? Yes, there's like two lungs, um, two kidneys, maybe two of a couple other things, but most of the things are actually not in pairs, you know? It's like, oh, one spleen, one stomach, the intestines are winding around. So that actually there's there's a lot of kind of inner shifting um, that's going on in that inner system as well. And there's a rhythm to, to those movements. And where are we synchronizing the attention? Where are we um, allowing the natural rhythms of the, the breath of the body to settle us, to ground us, to uh, bring us into a sense of reality that's outside of our thinking uh, conjurings? Where do we actually control the attention a little more so that it it synchronizes, right? So that it is uh, going with a rhythm um, that is a little more than if we just let it loose, kind of like a wild animal. What is the rhythm of our thoughts, right? That 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 actually there is a way that we, in this practice in particular, the Theravadan system is really focused on the idea of, of momentary events, consciousness, uh, of body experience, sense, all sense experience, these momentary experiences of contact. And so if you think about that, that there is a rhythm to contact, right, to fasa, uh, to, to the arising and passing of phenomena. You can think of the rhythm of hearing consciousness, the rhythm of seeing consciousness, of smelling, of tasting, of body consciousness, of uh, mind consciousness as well. And that there's a way that you can feel, it's like as a drumbeat there, as these, as the moment of consciousness arises, there is also a moment of volition, of action, right? So that like with every moment of volition, there is that, the that momentary action and then the waves that ripple from that the moment of action the waves the moment the ripples the moment the ripples you know i've been reading sometimes i get into this like not for long and not in a deeply mathematical way but of reading about like uh you know quantum theory quantum mechanics and and just this fact uh, that that really there's this understanding that you know, all particles have wave behavior and all waves have particle behavior or, fun or realities, you know, that, that, that there isn't such this sort of uh, distinction between those two phenomena. And that that is also true in the way that we can experience it. Maybe it's more metaphorical than actually uh, quantum in terms of how we're experiencing, uh, you know, vibration. Is it as particles or is it as waves? Or are we able to attune to it in some aspect of it before it decides, you know, uh, before it's totally clear? But that sense of like a drumbeat, right? The moment and the impact, the moment and the impact that the, the that's happening for us all the time. And what to what degree do we take responsibility for that? To what degree is some of it just kama, karma, right? That we're receiving these experiences in a rhythm that is based on past experience. And at and what point do we sort of receive that and feel the rhythm of our lives, the undercurrent that develop that sensitivity to it? 
And then what degree do we take responsibility for the rhythm of our actions, our mental actions, our physical actions, our verbal actions? And, and what they're generating, what is the wake that they're generating in the world around us? We're entering the winter here and that, that aspect of the ocean really changes in, the, in that the season. It's one of the places where there's sort of the most clear distinction in terms of the seasonal shifts here where these storms that start to arise thousands of miles away in the ocean um, have this ability to start, they start pushing in the same direction over a period of time, right? The winds are blowing onto the ocean uh, in a persistent and consistent way. And that energy gets put into the water, right? The energy gets infused into the water and starts to build these waves, right? These swells that grow and grow and grow. And then we are in this very sensitive, vulnerable place here in the middle of the ocean where those swells can become massive, you know, 30, 40, 50 foot, you know, swells in some places on the other islands. That's a classic example of concentration, right? That is what we, how we practice when, either when we're practicing mindfulness or when we're practicing something like the Brahma Viharas, the sense of the consistent application of attention, of mindful attention to what's happening over and over and over and over and over and over. It builds this, this rhythm of that, of bringing the attention back into mindfulness, bringing the attention back, builds an energy, builds a power, builds a force of mind that um, is something that we also then move in the wake of, right? It actually opens up the space uh, for us to move in. It's very powerful, you know, if we have, the same kind of capacity of building concentration in terms of loving kindness, in terms of uh, compassion, mudita, um, appreciative joy, uh, equanimity, upeka. Again, it's like we bring the attention back to this quality. We bring the attention back to love, to love, to love, to love. And that just like these storms, right? Just like this force it's, gets pushed into the world around us, there's a wake, there's a, a, a swell that builds, you know, and has its impact in the world around us, has its impact on our own hearts. Where do we have the sense of living in the rhythm of concentration, of goodness of heart, right? Of mindfulness, of all these beautiful qualities where do we start to take some responsibility for the ways in which, oh, we're, we're building the swell of anxiety, building the swells of anger, right? Of fear, of uh, cynicism, whatever it might be. You know, to really understand that it's like, what, what befalls us in the moment is outside of our control. But in this moment, we have some degree of uh, capacity, authority, responsibility for how we show up for that, how we ride those waves, how we navigate what we've inherited and how we propagate it or not forward and into the world around us, into our own lives, into our own bodies. You know, I think we can very easily get into the sense of ourselves as just these little particles, you know, these very individual um, little, I'm, I'm not trying to overstate this metaphor. It's just the word that's coming is, you know, a little quanta, <laughs> a little little pocket of, you know, a packet of energy um, that maybe like bounce, hits another being once in a while, right? But I think that they're, and, and, you know, that can have its value in terms of uh, our understanding, but where also do we see ourselves as waves, right? As like uh, this, this more of a, a time through which energy is moving. 
uh, and and understand that there is a volitional impact that our our minds and hearts make on that, you know. There's, you know, they say a shark can um, sense your heartbeat from like some ridiculous distance, you know, I don't know, like a couple football fields, like, you know, like several hundred yards, you know, which is of course terrifying if you're paddling alone <laughs> in your canoe out there. Uh, but also to recognize that there's something very powerful about that, that like actually that you, the kind of electromagnetic field of your heart, of your heartbeat is actually, it is pervading. It is having an experience, it has having an impact in the world around you, perceptible or not to you or others. There, there is this permeability, you know, to all phenomena. We don't normally or unnormally we kind of never recommend using the heartbeat as your primary anchor in meditation. Um, it's something that will arise for sure sometimes for people where you really notice the heartbeat. But generally it's something that we are so conditioned understandably to have such an existential relationship with <laughs> of like, fear or comfort and so any sense of sort of difference or change or variation in the experience of the heartbeat can lead to a lot of fear a lot of terror and um, it ends up not really being that helpful because sometimes it really is that the mind is experiencing something like the heart in a very different way the attention has is able to keep up with it in a way that makes it feel like it's slower or makes it feel like it's faster or more intense or less intense. And so there's a way that we, we don't recommend the heartbeat, that rhythm as, um, as, as our primary anchor in, in Vipassana practice. But we can acknowledge that, that it's there and sometimes we feel that. And we do, of course, understand that it's something that's connecting us to all other beings, all other you know, phenomena around us. Yeah, and so I just, you know, I think that there's something very important about learning to do this each on our own, right? That there is this responsibility to, to really understand the, the wisdom that can come from a deepening sensitivity and responsibility around our own rhythms, a rhythm of being. Um, of, of how we are experiencing the body and the senses and the mind in any moment, and then how we're engaging them and how we're unfolding them in the world uh, in a momentary way, you know, that is ultimately going to be where our deepest um, insights are going to come from. But on the other hand, to really also like take in that piece of the metaphor where there are important times where it's not just about everyone, you know, uh, marching to their own drummer, right? The sense of like, that there are actually times where it's important to sublimate our own rhythm, our own interests, our own impulses to that which might be for the greater good, uh, that which might be sort of for the collective and for the communal right? That that's what society is. That's what culture is, right? And that we take some part in that that feels beautiful and positive and that willingness to actually not always just be doing our own thing, uh, expressing our own impulses, our own desires, our own longings or, you know, whatever. And it's like, yes, there's a beauty to our individuality and to this um, experience of, and, and it's all we have direct responsibility for or sensitivity to is our own sense experiences. And yet we can see the value of like, what is it like to come into relationship with people who maybe really have a different rhythm of being than we do? And what does that look like? Where can we be interested in that versus just jarred by it? You know, where do we start to feel like, oh, there's a there's an interesting relationship between waveforms, you know, that is going on here versus like it's, like it's just dissonant. And it just doesn't work. Um, I've been 
listening to and doing more research on um you know, just different music. And I have a radio program at a local community radio station that I've been doing. And um, just really looking at, uh, just this week was was reading about how, um, you know, Dizzy Gillespie was one of the first um, American jazz uh, musicians and composers to start trying to bring in um, like Afro-Caribbean rhythms uh, into what was sort of, you know, traditional jazz, you know, North American jazz. Um, and of course that included all kinds of African rhythms, you know, that that he had already been integrating and trying to understand. And, you know, there's like very powerful experimentation that he started to do with some Cuban artists in particular. And so there's one famous song that, that they recorded, Manteca, which was considered to be one of the first kind of experiments around this. And it's really fun and kind of interesting where they explore it. Um, but but what I was interesting was I read was like when they first started trying to perform together and tour together, it was very difficult that, that actually like they could kind of get it down for recording. But when they were riffing and kind of going into their natural way of playing, that the um, you know, the North American artists and the jazz musicians, the kind of classical jazz musicians, you know, they had their rhythm culture that they had developed and created a musical culture and was so deeply ingrained in them. And these Afro-Cuban rhythms were very different, actually. There were a lot of places where they didn't just line up. And so they had to go through this process uh, of playing with each other for quite a long time before it started to feel like they could really mix and not lose their individual identities, right? To still understand the differences, but also come to a place where they were growing something new and something different. And I think there's a very powerful lesson in that for all of us where it's like people who we wanna be in relationship with, but we, we have, you know, are from different cultural backgrounds who are, are people we don't wanna be in relationship with and we're from different cultural backgrounds uh, or there's just different rhythms of being that you might call cultural, you might, that, that might just be around different layers of experience and identity. And yet, where is there the value in, in having it not quite sound right for a while, right? Having it be a little bit tense or a little bit undefined, um, a little bit messy, a little bit sloppy, so that we learn and that we actually learn about our own rhythmic systems internally and we learn about others um, and start to be able to sort of take responsibility for what might be a shared uh, culture, right? Shared elements of shared um being and expression and um working together you know to be able to be in this world in a good way so it does really take understanding ourselves understanding what are these natural ways of being uh getting better at those getting clear about them experimenting and practicing and there is this this sense of like oh where where then do we play with others and um what are the challenges of that? What are the beauties of that? What are the opportunities of that? What are the responsibilities in that? Hmm. So yeah, that'll uh, be the offering for today. And as usual, we have some time. If anyone has any um, questions uh, about your practice, about the instructions, about the talk, um, anything that we we'll would be able to support you with in this this next week, um, you can raise your little blue hand, and I'll turn this thing on so people can unmute themselves when we call on you. Yeah, Quinn, there you go. Can you unmute? Hey. Well, uh, th this is a very uh stimulating talk for me, uh, Jesse, uh, in, in these uh, times when, when we are uh, led by, uh, by a leader who uh, promote uh, divisiveness and hatred. Uh, for me, it's important to understand myself and understand others. Uh, but it's hard to understand the thinking of, let's say, a white supremacist or 
a, a, a woman hater or a, you know an anti-immigrant? How do you propose that? If I yes, I mean if I <laughs> if I had the perfect answer to that, you know, we we'd be in a different place. I mean, I always think that it's it's a it's a process that we're careful with, right? That we go into relationship across difference when it's I'd say that it's important to do it when we're safe, right? So that if like if we feel physically safe enough and emotionally sort of stable enough to be able to engage across difference that there there's an important responsibility to try to do that and i think it is well understood that part of part of that can develop around building a foundation on some common ground right um whether that's food music uh sports, you know, like that th there are different places where we, whatever we might relate to or not in terms of like an actual physical person. And that's different than like reading about someone on the news who's done something or it's like you can't you can't build a relationship with an idea or a story of someone who you think about, but you have the ability to maybe build a relationship with someone you actually encounter who might be very different from us. And if there is a sense that you're actually still physically safe and that, that there's there's safety and engagement um, which I do feel like is an important foundation. And so when there's not safety, when it doesn't feel emotionally safe or physically safe, that we actually don't concern ourselves too much with stretching, right? That we don't put ourselves in too much danger to try to come to resolution or understanding or healing. That, that at that point, the, the, the work of self-care and self-preservation is actually more important. But when there is stability, I think that, you know, there is the work of finding common ground whether again, like things, things that might be more neutral, then there's like the do, doing common work together um, often is a place that can be like very powerful, you know? So like community, you know, volunteer projects that might not be so much of a thing culturally here as much as some places, but that kind of thing, you know, pitching in and working together. Um, I think that there are places where practices of storytelling, you know, of like being interested, you know, Thich Nhat Han, he has that, you know, very powerful statement. I remember when Osama bin Laden, right after 9-11, when that happened, someone asked him, you know, what would you, if you could, if you could engage Osama bin Laden, what would you say to him? And his response was, oh, I would just listen, you know, and that sense of, wow, the, the wisdom of understanding of how much anger, hatred, violence comes out of sometimes people's pain feeling like it can't be expressed or isn't heard or isn't recognized and that it, it, it feels the need to come out in these really terrible ways. And so I do think that, um, you know, there are ways of creating solidarity or this language I like a fluidarity of like, ah, okay, you, you, find a, you find a bond for some period of time and then you let it go. And you understand there's places where you're not gonna agree, where you're not gonna be in relationship with people and that you try to take the goodness of where you can um, and not feel like you need to resolve all relationships all the time um, and understand that it's like piecemeal. And we, if we can find one good place of connection, that that's very inspiring and something beautiful. And then there's places where it's not gonna exist and we don't try to force it or get into conflict necessarily around it because even within our own families, never mind people who we think are really different than us. Even our own yes. families, there's like people who are going to very much disagree about things that are very important to us. And sometimes it's like, okay, we're not always. It's like the the draining of how it is to be always fighting, always fighting. And where do you like put it down? And just like try to do something <laughs> nice together. Yes. And you only see once a year, or whatever you know, because it's like that's what actually the relationship can maintain. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's that's very true. Thank you. Because yeah. for me right now, I feel so emotional that your advice or Thich Nhat Hanh advice is to just listen. For me, yeah. that's good enough. Mm. I don't have to say anything else. I just listen. I think it's very valuable, very valuable teaching. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Michelle, I don't, do you have anything you want to add? To that? Oh, your microphone is down. Um, 
I think sometimes accepting that we might not understand somebody's hatred is okay. I, I think that um, that whole teaching of accepting how things are versus how we think they should be and accepting sometimes there is that um, those moments when we really can't fathom that level of hatred, that that's, um, that's a good place to start, that it's, it's okay that we're limited in that way and that we don't, um, in a way, thankfully, don't have a, a, a measurement within ourselves of, of that kind of hatred. Like that you, you tend to under, we tend to understand that which we experience ourselves. And so that, that we don't understand it could be a good sign. You know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> yes. that it doesn't have to be something right. negative. It could be something quite positive. Uh, I think that um, from that baseline of accepting it, I think then as Jesse's saying, and there's so many places to go <clears throat> where we can connect with meta in that deeper place where we're, where we're not connecting with the behavior of someone or their hatred, but we're connecting to their, the felt sense of them, right? right? And that, that yeah. that's a baseline of connection. So I think that I'm answering it in a little different way, but it's the same answer in finding ways that we find a common ground um, where we don't have to feel separate. And I think the, the, the listening is important, but also then there, there can be a question of wondering, just that pure wonder, like, I wonder why like this person is like this, like, like that. I just that it, it, if it's fake, then it's time to stop and just listen. But if there is a way in which we can genuinely wonder what happened to this being, because we all know that hatred is so painful. It's, it's like if you practice enough, this is what the Buddha taught, that aversion and attachment are so painful and there's such a um, misperception of reality that, that you can wonder why. And usually often if you do fathom, there's probably the most has been written about Hitler than it, most um, tyrants. Um, there, there's a level where you can understand how somebody could end up like that. And then there are some beings that you can't. There are some beings that there's a kind of karma of hatred that it, it comes from another lifetime. That, that understanding it doesn't mean that we don't want to stop the behavior. And that's the difference. It's like you're asking if, like when you're asking this genuinely, it brings you, as Jesse is saying, it's bringing us very deep. Because we all know if you're not fully enlightened or at least third stage of enlightenment, we do suffer from anger and hatred and so the, the more we understand it in ourselves but then thankfully there isn't a level where you do understand that i think that that's a wonderful karma <laughs> thank you yeah yeah I mean, I'll just say, say to go back to my own metaphor of like, you know, there are people who I paddle with who we are very different. And some of them, it's like different in a way that feels like really interesting and fun. And somewhere it's like very challenging, you know, where it's political views are like very, you know, at a different spectrum than mine um, and or the other end of the spectrum. And so what's kind of has been powerful, it's like, there's something that's, it's like, it's not just that it's okay that I can do this one activity with this person where it's like, we can get together and like 
paddle in unison for an hour this way and an hour back and like that's it our relationship doesn't need to be more than that but there's actually something important about knowing that like this feels okay and actually good and maybe even important so that if something more dramatic happened in society and we're drawn on other like opposite sides of a line that actually there's something there to build on that's built on right there's something there's a connection there's some sense of each other's humanity that is um and so, for example, like this person who then got cancer and has been going undergoing treatment, it's like, oh, there's actually a, a human sympathy that I can feel for this person and the connection Definitely. and the caring that um, is outside of behavior or opinions or views that has been very important, you know? Yeah. 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 Hmm. <laughs> uh, Molly? Oh, let's see, you gotta, let's see, unmute there. There yeah. we go. Hi. Um, hi, hi. Um, so I've been working a lot with the not mine, not I, and I like that a lot. Oh, I like that a lot. Um, but when I get sleepy, I notice, and I do tend to get sleepy, I notice judgment. And so then I go to the not mine, not I, and then there's also the responsibility issue of like, well, I'm, am I sleepy because I didn't go to sleep on time last night? Um, all those reasons. So there's a mix. Want me to start? Yeah. Sure. Um, what's so fascinating about this is that what happened is that the sleepiness happened but then the judgment and the, the seeing the judgment, relating to the judgment as not me, not mine, could be more helpful than trying to figure out why you were sleepy, right? Okay, okay. And yeah. And that's, that's what's so hard. It's like these, these sequences that happen and we tend to be trying to get back to the, sleepiness but actually what's happening is the judgment the, the sleepiness is in the past but we do this i'm not trying to say that it's very hard to see the resistance it's slippery and the aversion to the sleepiness and so that that making space for that sense of the possessiveness is really more acute with the judgment right yeah yeah and then I know when I find myself this morning, my first sitting this morning, I like I really f felt like, oh, you know, I finally had a morning where, you know, I've been very busy and I felt less sleepy. And then I went to sit and I, my mind felt so dull. And I had that moment where I started trying to figure out like, you know, when you're trying to figure out like, why am I sleepy? We're already caught in aversion. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's like the that boy you know you can how long have I practiced with sleepiness and dullness like forever you know just I'll get it that's where my judgment will really come in I'll be like come on like <laughs> it's like how long is it going to take you to like totally have unconditional acceptance all the time with it well nope not yet <laughs> But it's fascinating to see how that possessiveness comes with more of the reaction than the actual orig origin of the situation. It's, it's amazing. And exciting. I mean, I think the more that I see that in myself and others, the more I, I have a lot of more patience with the resistance and the, the judgment, the aversion, getting that I, I rather try to figure out the sleepiness than be with the unpleasantness of the judgment. How do you figure out the sleepiness? Pardon? How do you figure out the sleepiness with I interest, mindfulness or? Oh, it's more if you it, it's more like under accepting it rather than figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah. As I get older, there's more sleep. There's more sleepiness. I'm finding. I have no idea where it's going, 
but um, unless I get maybe less busy, I'm going to just keep noticing it and um, noticing that I, I don't like it at times and accepting that. Accepting aversion is really hard. Much easier to accept sleepiness than aversion to sleepiness. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's good. It's good practice. We we think, oh, sleepiness. You know, I want to get to something better. But sleepiness is the best teacher for like identification of anything. We we want to be able to control it, and we sit there trying to figure out, well, maybe I should have had a cup of coffee, right? Or whatever. You know, whatever we do, you know, with our mind, where we think we should be able to control it, whereas it just low energy happened. It's okay one of my best teachers maybe primary teacher yeah sometimes i have the phrase energy drop oh ah, that's great but lately it hasn't been around <laughs> <laughs> well here it comes it's coming back <laughs> great i'm glad you asked it it's a hard yeah no, well yeah. there's a pretty good chance that we'll die with an experience that's something like sleepiness and like do we want to be giving ourselves a hard time about it you know is that the is that the moment where you're like geez what's wrong with me like i'm such a jerk you know it's like no like you don't want to waste your last moments giving yourself a hard time about what's happening it's like <laughs> that sense of like oh right this is this might be what it's going to be like and this is like your rehearsal you're getting to <laughs> rehearse and that might bring a little more energy uh, mm -hmm. if you take that <laughs> but also just to be careful too about like that it is such a useful phrase of like not me not mine that reminder of like oh right you're there's like there's an identification here somewhere there's a possessiveness there's a clinging and there's that reminder but it can also turn into something that's not investigative right we were just trying to convince yourself that this isn't me and mine and be careful about the tone internally that that phrase has where are you starting to be like not me not mine like you know like like beating yourself up about like you know don't 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 identify versus at some point the only way we start to learn about identification is actually through experiencing it right so it's you're not just also not fighting sleepiness but you're also not fighting identification it's like, you have to understand. It's like, well, well, yeah, actually I can say not me, not mine, but it sure feels like I am sleepy and I am really annoyed by that. And I am really frustrated. And so it's like, rather than try to trick yourself to be like, it's not you. It's like, well, what is this I? Like, wh what does meanness feel like? And try to find it, you know, try, like that's the ticket is like, really like the, the meanness isn't anywhere. It doesn't exist. It, it arises as, a, as a, a product of a certain kind of relationship to experience, but there isn't like a me kind of watching, but, but, but we need to see that, you know? And so, so that it's like, oh yeah, be, being genuinely interested in, in the sense of self and the sense of me is also ultimately the place where the Vipassana practice needs to go. And that you use the phrase as that reminder to get a little distance, but then when you have the distance, it's like exploring, you know, and not hoping that it's gonna get rid of it, you know, uh, get rid of the experience. Mm -hmm. Great, really great. I'm actually very excited about this because I just want to, I know sometimes it takes time. I think teaching identification and non-identification is so difficult because when you start talking about not me, not I, not mine, then we think we should be, as Jesse's saying, I'm just amplifying it because I'm excited about it and that when we start feeling like it's my sleepiness, we'll reject it versus explore it or like my fear, like that if that's, if that's really what's happening, then you try to accept and explore it rather than trying to get to not me, not mine sometimes. Do you, do you see? And that, like, that's really the art of meditation, really, is that we forget that the, with, without conditions, the unconditional acceptance means we're including how identification, how, what that experience is. In fact, it's a lot of our experience. And if we're rejecting it versus trying to understand it and investigate it, we won't ever really um, be free. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. So it's a great, it's great. It's a great exploration and it's um, very happy about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Amanda. Hi. Hi. Um, building on Molly's question, you talked a lot in the talk earlier about our responsibility in sending out those waves and the impact. And I'm wondering, I'm finding myself wrestling a little bit between the non-identification and understanding one's own responsibility in our interactions and actions in the world. Totally, yeah. Well, it's a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's exactly, it's such a great, it's like the perfect paradox, you know, and, um, and it just happens to be that both are true, you know, it's like, we're both particles and waves, and we both are, there is no coherent self, and we have total responsibility for the results of our actions. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's, um, I, I, I know Michelle will have more to say. I mean, I think that part of it is, It, it's such, I think there, to me, there's a place of a, such deep appreciation for conditioning and conditionality and, and that sense of, gosh, how hard it is to not respond in a, a way that's been so conditioned in us to something unpleasant or to something pleasant. You know, it's like how many of us have some parts of our own behavior that we wish we could change or would be less harmful to others or to ourselves. And like, there's something so important in the non-self aspect of things of really getting the, the, the profound conditioning of the mind based on, on past experience and how ourselves and everyone and all beings beyond the human, how hard it is to actually be um, the recipient of, of this flood of, of conditioned phenomena that is out of our control of pleasant experience and unpleasant experience of, of things that might eat us and things that we want to eat and you know like like just like and and so that the mind how how conditioned it becomes and how solid it starts to feel in terms of its patterns of response uh, and that those patterns are personal in our lifetimes they're cultural they're human they're just the, the, in the inheritance of being of of since you know time immemorial and so there is something i do feel like in that appreciation of watching of understanding oh mind and matter as so deeply conditioned um, that is very beautiful. And actually, again, paradoxically, as we look into our own experience, actually helps us understand other people and, and mm -hmm. the common shared kind of experience of being. Um, and then at the same time, with mindfulness and with sort of the observation of these patterns, that we start to see that there's space that actually an unpleasant experience can arise. We mm -hmm. see the contraction in the heart. We see the contraction in the mind, the wanting or the not wanting. And then we, there's this amazing ability to like care or to just be at peace with it. And so that we start to see that there is still this sense of individual personal responsibility that does arise. And yet it's not just a matter of willpower, but a matter of wisdom which mm. is rooted in insight and that that is complicated and sort of how those things work but that ultimate that, like on one hand that we have a sort of ultimate responsibility and ultimate non essence is um it's a it's a powerful paradox but that's what i think we do learn to trust in the practice it's like where the paradox seems most extreme is there often is the place where there's sort of the deepest truths um at play and 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 rather than trying to resolve them and feel like they need to come into sort of a unified agreement. There's a way that you can accept certain things as true in different circumstances and yeah. different conditions, and that 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 will start to build um, a, a more kind of yeah, like coherent view of it. I guess I'd also say that there is a sense that a fully enlightened being doesn't generate karma, right? That there is a way that there is there is no ripple from their yeah. actions, and that that 
is still maybe is in the realm of metaphor, but it's something very powerful of like, actually, what does that mean in terms of karma and non-self? <laughs> that actually, when there's the fullest realization of, of non-self, of conceit has totally fallen apart, that actually there is no more, there are no more ripples that get created in our actions. That um, is a interesting addition to the the mystery of it. Michelle, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a real. You know, this is such a good, wonderful group and uh, great questions. Um, I I I actually feel like mostly most of us are motivated to practice because we understand something about what you asked. That, that we tend to put ourselves through this process of, you know, the liberation process because we understand somewhere that we do have responsibility. Mm -hmm. And um, that sense that I do feel also that the means and ends of this practice are the same and that that's so inspiring to me that, that when you taste even two seconds of non-possessiveness, right, of experience, anatta, when we taste that even for a few seconds, it has such impact that we get that that experience is what a fully enlightened being is living with all the time, right? Like that, that you're, it's like that means and ends are the same in that moment. That has such impact that we're motivated to keep practicing because it has such power. And we'll, we might forget, you know, we might forget, but, but then we'll have this moment where there's, there's truly genuinely no aversion and attachment present. And it's like so wonderful. It's peace, peace tastes wonderful. Being responsible to be more peaceful is why we're practicing, right? Mm -hmm. Because we do understand that when we're stomping around, having a tantrum in the grocery store that, you know, I might be exaggerating, but you know what I mean? Whenever we yell at somebody, you know, like, oh, the worst is if you yell at a kid, right? Like that, you know, you sound like your great grandfather that's still repeating itself through generations, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, you just like, you just go, whoa, maybe I could do better, right? I'm sorry, like, I'm sorry, you know, and whether that starts to quiet down somewhat, but, you know, it's like, we all, again, unless you really are an arahant, you know, we do lose it sometimes. And if rather than getting caught up in a lot of self-hatred, it's motivating to try to understand what happened, the conditions for what happened to, to express our apologies and to try to um, start again. That's starting again. The most important thing is the responsibility to start again and to do our best, you know, in that process. It, I would just add one more thing where the Srinazar Gadada says um, something so beautiful. He says, the stars affect us and we affect them deeply and that to me that's such a beautiful way to express that responsibility thank you Bob. yeah yeah i mean i think I'll, it's like anatta doesn't mean that we don't exist it's mm. just that we have a a conditioned misinterpretation of what existence is mm. and then it's it's more like along those lines apparently, mm -hmm. <laughs> of us and the stars, <laughs> than like the way we tend to interpret it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have time for one more question. I'll see, Julia, are you there? Oops, I lost. You. Yes. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, yeah. cool. Um, so. I love this and it's so helpful and wonderful and I'm, I'm so inspired and impressed by you guys that have created a way of being in the world that, you know, approaches 
what you care about and and what is so worthwhile i think <laughs> to share with the world <laughs> um so i i really let's see how do i i don't know the right the good language around this um <laughs> Like I get that mamankara is not the best way, you know, and this is me, mine, and and I I really could just kind of hang out in emptiness and I don't feel like I'm being that reactive inside. Um and yet the girl downstairs just got an animal to which I'm highly allergic, right? So, so like the body is real and it's, um, I feel like I'm communicating well and um, trying to be graceful and trying to be aware if there are any old patterns coming up and wanting to love everyone involved, especially myself and, um, and yeah, it's like a very real thing where I itch inside and out in my lungs and my breathing is and I like I put a dish towel on my pillow because there's like goo. And <laughs> I can't believe this is gonna be on Facebook now. But um, so I'm just wondering, <laughs> you know, I, it, tips on links between you know the mundane and the like uber groovy aspects of the practice yeah, totally yeah i think we both <laughs> we both will have things to say about that in the terms of just as being like allergic types and you know sort of sensitive to whatever and being on the road and traveling to different places where you know sometimes those things can get accommodated other times not it's like um I think there is just that sense of understanding that like while the the freedom that we're aspiring to is conditionless like right a conditionless acceptance and peace of mind no matter what's happening um that it takes mm -hmm. actually some protective conditions in order to develop that capacity right so when we're doing our meditation you know the encouragement is to close your eyes right so that you're not as involved in all the external stimulus the, in, the encouragement is to you know not do it out on the sidewalk and for busy street but to do it in a place that feels quiet and protected right that like at the very baseline of this practice is understanding that certain conditions are going to be helpful for us to feel like we have that sense of capacity to grow and certainly that you know these enlightened fully enlightened beings that exist and existed in those days you know there's they went through plenty of physical suffering the buddha himself you know had a kind of hard death you know um you know people got sick so it isn't like that people stopped having physical dukkha it's that their mind was still liberated amidst that so it's sort of also like this other thing of like well we get where the limitations of our bodies are and we get where the limitations of our minds are and we don't try to go beyond that if it's if it's pushing outside the realms of of wisdom and compassion right that if we're starting to kind of force ourselves or feel like you know oh we should be able to be okay with this or whatever other sort of trips we might lie on ourselves it's like okay actually this is beyond the limit of my body to be healthy and of my mind to feel like it has any access to kindness or or you know compassion or whatever and so at that point there is a sense of like where what where can we find some way to work out the conditions you know so that we'll feel more protected and that's probably of course a whole other thing in terms of your home and where the spaces are sort of separate and where you feel like you have room or not where you can compromise with someone or where they can't I mean I think that's like you know of course a whole other a whole other challenge in terms of just humans living together and trying to be together but it's really painful and i think that piece of like letting yourself feel the genuine grief you know of feeling like not respected or not cared for or not listened not appreciated not valued whatever those things might be that there's like a genuine sadness around that um and then well, yeah what are the choices you have to make around that i think are are something of course we figure out over time but i think it's um 
the baseline of just getting that there are conditions that are actually supportive that we need to protect, you know, given all kinds of differences between us. And um, yeah, that we of course aspire to a peace that's beyond conditions, a love that's beyond it, but that to not pretend like we're there and, and to acknowledge what we need to support ourselves. I don't know, Michelle, what you might wanna add. In a way, it's easier. It's easier for most people to disappear when they have kind of an uh, inclination toward peace. You know, like more, more. Mm. It's easier to disappear than appear. It appearing in the way that you have to when you have allergies in a situation like you do. It. For, for somebody like me, it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant to say, I have this need. Even saying that is hard. You know, it took me a lot of practice, to, you know, and that, that my need is actually important enough that we actually have to do something or I have to move, right? Or you have to move or being right. able, right. you know, it's nice to bask in emptiness, but it's like appearing <laughs> in that way, I find, a little bit easier, but it's a karmic knot that I have to work with in my lifetime. I, I came in this world extremely allergic. It's like, I, the only good news is that more and more people, since I was born in 51, more and more people are getting allergies. <laughs> that yeah, I have more company. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just joking really, but it's true. And I was a kid, hardly anybody had them. And then, you know, with all the chemical environmental stuff, more and more people have them. So actually there, there's a lot more people who understand it nowadays than they used to. You know, it's like, but it's still that sense of like having to appear, having to be different, having to ask for something. And that if you ask and, and, the, and it, there isn't a receptivity to it, that I would have to do something else. And that that was hard, but it's like, it's like a great teaching for not mistaking um, spiritual practice to not include appearing and acting on your own behalf at times it's like it's your body it's not like it's not doesn't have to be my body but it's definitely taking care of your body and doing what you have to do it's been a great practice for me like it it's a uh, not always easy but it's great it'll force you it'll force you to appear and not just <laughs> disappear yeah yeah mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you both. No, I mean, I just, I really want to reiterate. I mean, I think there is, it's like our karma is our doorway for spiritual growth, <laughs> for sure. And that it's not <laughs> always just like, oh, your growth is to be okay with like having snot drip from your face. Day. It's like, <laughs> actually, maybe your growth is like, yeah, like, right, sticking up for yourself and like actually being solid in a way uh, yeah. that's, that's less comfortable for you. I'd say the other piece for, this is this is like not the spiritual tip this is except for on one level of course it is okay. it's like we're both you know i'll <laughs> say for myself like i'll chew on bitter herbs and steep things and you know but i take plenty of western medicine like it's like zyrtec and <laughs> nasal sprays and it's like actually they work and and we live in a world in which like those of us who like are super sensitive actually like need to kind of blow it out sometimes you know so that's a <laughs> wow tip on i feel like i really <laughs> asked people with empathy thank yeah. you for supporting care of the personal collection <laughs> uh, it's so intense mm. when your system <laughs> is that sensitive yeah mm. allergies are very tiring after a while it's very tiring and that's a that's a sign that you need to you know do something at some point it wears you out yeah, yeah. i have 10 million stories of <laughs> you know traveling and teaching and having people having to set up tents for me outside so i can teach <laughs> and like having a, a you know massive hurricane come and you know i mean i just like endless stories of just this isn't take uh take the rug out please take the rug out of the meditation hall 
I'm all, you know, like endless stories of that. Just like, it's amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think most people can look back at who were involved and laugh at like, like the extremes. You know, the cyclone that hit when I was out in the tent is probably the best story, but there's many, yeah. <laughs> oh. well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Really good to see you. Yeah, good luck this week. It's heating up, it's heating up, it's heating up. <laughs> Cooling down. Lots of, lots of meta. <laughs> Gotta keep. Take good care. Great questions. Great talk. Wow. <laughs> so fast. Hmm. Hmm.